I want to begin our study this evening by reading from the first chapter of the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1, beginning at verse 1, and we'll just go through three verses here. Acts 1, verses 1 through 3. The former account I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, until the day in which he was taken up, after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now we'll just walk away from those verses for just a moment. I want to share with you what is a fable. Now keep in mind, I've already told you it's a fable. A fable is not true. It is said, I'm using this just simply as a means of illustration and to make a point. But the fable goes something like this. Jesus and an angel were walking through heaven one day. And the angel was aware of the fact that Jesus was going to come as a sacrifice upon this earth for our sins. And that men were going to be saved through him. And the angel asked Jesus in this fable, Tell me, Jesus, what is your method and your means of saving people? And in the fable, Jesus responds to the angel by saying, Well, here's how it's going to work. One person will hear the gospel of salvation, and that person will respond and be saved. And then that person who is saved will share that gospel story with another. And that person will believe and then obey and be saved. And this is the way that the world will come to know me and be in a relationship with God. And the angel listened to that and said to Jesus, Well, now that sounds pretty good. But what is your backup plan in case that doesn't work? <laughs> and in the fable, Jesus said, I have no backup plan. Amen. If that doesn't work, then men will not be saved. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that every one of what we refer to as the synoptic gospels ends with what we refer to as the Great Commission? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and preach the gospel, or go ye therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's Matthew's account of the Great Commission. Mark's account, Mark 16 and verse 15, finds Jesus saying, uh, you know, go throughout the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved, and he who does not believe will be condemned. Luke concludes his gospel in Luke chapter 24 and verse 47 by quoting Jesus to saying that, you know, that... Uh, Repentance for the remission of sins will be preached beginning in Jerusalem in His name. Every one of those accounts are the Great Commission. That is to save the world because, of, because that was Jesus' plan from the beginning and there is no backup plan. Amen. And the verses that we read here from the first chapter of the book of Acts is really a continuation of Luke's gospel. Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. Remember, he concludes his gospel with the great commission that repentance for the remission of sins be preached at Jerusalem in his name, beginning at Jerusalem. And now we find in the book of Acts, this is exactly what is occurring. And they, he, Jesus was with them prior to his ascension, and he was speaking to them things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Thus began the great commission carrying out the commission to save lost humanity. And you know what? Acts, 20, uh, Acts chapter 28 and verse 31 finds the Apostle Paul in the city of Jerusalem. And you know what he's doing? He's preaching things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now what I'm going to challenge you to do right now, as my slide has already given you an indication of, if you would open your Bibles to the 29th chapter of the book of Acts. And raise your hand when you get there. <laughs> if you raise your hand, I'm going to see your Bible. <laughs> because you know and I know that the book of Acts ends in Acts 28 and verse 31 with Paul in the city of Jerusalem preaching things pertaining to the kingdom of God. 
But what is interesting about that is it almost seems like there ought to be another chapter. Now there isn't. Because the book of Acts concludes in Acts chapter 28. But doesn't it seem as though you just kind of want to turn the page and see what happens after that? Well, the reality is the book of Acts, while it may end in Acts 28 and verse 31, the commission does not end. Do you realize that this congregation is part of the great commission? Do you understand that? The reason that you exist upon this earth is not just to assemble once or twice a week and to break bread every Sunday. That's important. That's part of our relationship with God. But we exist as local congregations to bring to the world the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. We're part of the Great Commission. Now, while the book of Acts may end insofar as uh, the Holy Spirit's writings are concerned with chapter 28, it doesn't end as far as the commission is concerned. We're part of that commission. Now, I want to ask you something when we think about that. How are we doing today? How, you know, what's being written about us and the efforts that we're putting forth to carry out the Great Commission? We're part of that commission. We continue the commission that Jesus established. As we go back to look at the, at, at the, gospel, at the gospel accounts of the Great Commission. Now I want to show you something that's interesting. Now you stay with me on this as we talk about the gospel story. Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, that as you begin reading the book of Acts, what begins in Acts chapter 1 and verse 15 with 120 disciples soon increases to about 3,000, about 5,000 men and women in Acts chapter 4 and in verse 4. What you see throughout the book of Acts, the number of disciples now are multiplied. In Acts 21 and verse 20, there are many thousands now who became Christian. What happened? 120 in the upper room. Now what do you have down here? You have many thousands who have become Christians. You find in Colossians 1 and verse 6 that the gospel in 35 years had reached the entire world, that is the Mediterranean Roman Empire world. These disciples were serious about the, the commission. They were spreading the gospel of Christ. Colossians 1 and verse 23, Paul said it had touched every creature. Jesus said preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized will be saved. It is estimated by the close of the first century what began with 120 disciples in an upper room in Jerusalem. Some estimates put it at the close of the first century that there were a million disciples on the face of the earth. I look at that and I am astounded. I look at that and I say, what in the world is going on that enabled such a growth as that to be experienced in the first century? But that in and of itself, while it is impressive all by itself, there's more to that than simply meets the eye. Do you realize that they did that even though they didn't have Sundays off from work? Many of these disciples were slaves. They didn't have, you know, they, didn't, they couldn't just check out and, uh, you know, tell the employer, you know what, I need to be off on Sunday because we worship at 10 o'clock. They couldn't do this. They didn't have Sundays off. They didn't have laws that were passed by Rome that were favorable to Christianity. You know what? They couldn't deduct their contribution from their income tax. They didn't have comfortable church buildings such as we have that are heated in the wintertime and cooled in the summer. They didn't have God-fearing political leaders that would enable them to have some laws passed that would help them. They didn't have access to complete Bibles. They couldn't come in church buildings and pick out a Bible to find from Matthew to Revelation. It wasn't there. Oh, they could have had access to the Old Testament scrolls or scriptures. They didn't have access to whole Bibles. They didn't have religious books written about Christ or books detailing how the church is to grow. They didn't have schools of evangelism. They didn't have radio the internet or television to be able to propagate the gospel. I'll tell you what they did have, however. They had severe opposition and they had severe persecution. But even at that, 
Even at what they didn't have and what they did have, they were able, ladies and gentlemen, to turn the world upside down for Christ. This was what they did in the first century. Now, now again, I have to challenge each of us. How are we doing today? How do we stack up in the 21st century church with the first century church? How do we do? How are we doing in the field and in the area of evangelism? Have we picked up that banner that they put down in the first century? What's being written about us? A hundred years from now, two hundred years if the Lord remains in heaven and doesn't come back by then. What is going to be said in books of history? about the 21st century church in America, are we turning the world upside down? You know what, my friends? I'm going to tell you something. In order for us to be able to turn the world upside down, you know what? The Lord has to turn us upside down. It has to begin with each one of us. The Lord has to upset the way that we view Christianity. The Lord has got to upset the way that we view the lost. The Lord has got to upset the way that we view life upon this earth if we're going to be able to duplicate what we read about in the book of Acts. It is amazing. It is absolutely astounding. How is it possible? What I want to do for the next few moments is I want us to go back and look in the book of Acts and let's see what those people did. Let's see how they were able to do that. And then let every one of us be challenged. Let this congregation be challenged to duplicate what they did. And see if in fact we can turn the world upside down that we're living in today. It begins right here. It begins, ladies and gentlemen, by trusting in God's power to save lost humanity. This is where it has to begin. Every one of us has to have a renewed respect for the power of God that it will do the, the job God intends for it to do. Notice what's said in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus said to these apostles, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. That is the outline of the book of Acts. Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you receive this great power, you're going to start right here in the city of Jerusalem, and you're going to preach my gospel, and then you're going to the outlying region of Judea, and now after the gospel reaches there, you're going to go out to Samaria, and after it reaches there, you're going to go to the ends of the earth. And you know what? You go to Acts chapter 2 and you find in the first four verses that the Holy Spirit was poured out from heaven upon these disciples. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And somebody says, J.R., you're certainly not talking about us being baptized in the Holy Spirit. No, I'm not. Because the apostles were the ones that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes, they received the divine power of God. And they began to, you know what they began to do? They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But what they were speaking were words of salvation. Amen. That's what they were teaching. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 and 4, how that by revelation He, that is God, made known to me the mystery as I wrote before in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge into the mystery of Christ. This is exactly what they were. But you know what? I'm going to tell you something. When they received the Holy Spirit, they were being led or guided into all the, here's the word, truth. They were guided into all the truth. And Jesus told them that as they spoke that truth, that it would be that truth that would set men free. Now look, I want you to notice what happened now. Over here in the second chapter of the book of Acts, when the apostle Peter and the others received the Spirit of God, and they began to speak those truths, those words of salvation. This is what, here's what Peter said in verse 14. Acts 2 and verse 14. Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and do what? Heed 
my words. You know what he was speaking? He was speaking the gospel. Romans 1 and verse 16 says that those words that Peter spoke, the gospel is the power of God to save. It pleased God, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21, it pleased God by the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. He, my words. Now notice, notice verse 37 of the same chapter. Now when they heard this, heard what? Heard the words of salvation. Heard the truth of God. Heard the power of God to say. When they heard this, they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? We want to be saved. Tell us what to do to be saved. And Peter told them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. But now, notice we continue on. Verse 4. And with what? And with many other words. He testified and exhorted them saying, be saved from this perverse generation. You know what? I'm going to tell you something. What happened in the first century, ladies and gentlemen, is that those men who were committed to preaching the gospel of Christ, those men, th that early church, they trusted the power of God to save. They trusted the power of that word. Notice in Acts 4 and verse 33. And with great power the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were, they, they were speaking words to these people as to what they needed to do to be saved. Now let's transport ourselves back from the first century to the 21st century. You know what you're hearing today? You, you, you know what some people are saying today? Some people are saying today, you know what? It doesn't do any good to have gospel meetings anymore. It doesn't do any good to have Bible studies. It doesn't do any good to preach the gospel. No, it doesn't do it. You've got to understand something. We're living in a different time. We're living in a different place. And people don't respond to that like they, you know what? What that says is, I do not trust the power of God to save. I need something else. We need nothing else. Churches across the width and breadth of this great land are devising schemes and gimmicks and everything under the sun in order to draw a crowd. And you know what's being left by, by the side of the road is the preaching of the gospel of Christ. Amen. We need gospel preaching and it still remains in the 21st century the power of God to save. I'm going to tell you something. I'm not opposed to church buildings in any way, shape, manner, or form. But I tell you, you want to impress the community, you don't impress them by great facades. You don't impress them with, you know, with, with, with cathedral-type buildings. You don't draw a crowd with, with music that sounds like it's professional. These are not the things that save people. You don't draw crowds by providing something for the young and for this and for that group. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having Bible classes for young or ladies or anything like that. I'm not saying that. But you want to know what saves people is the preaching of the gospel of Christ. This is what people need. It's the same in the 21st century as it was in the 1st century. People are lost and they need to hear words of salvation. And I want you to think about something. You know, you know why you know why play, why churches sometimes are dwindling and dying and why churches aren't growing? Because we've gone away from the preaching of the gospel of Christ. You want to see some you know what happened in Jerusalem? You know in Acts chapter 5 and, and verse 28, the Bible says that these disciples had filled well, well listen now, had filled Jerusalem with their teaching. What about us? We fill in Kansas City with our teaching. What about us? We fill in Blue Springs with our teaching. We fill in Lee Summit with our teaching. Are we fill in Missouri with our teaching. What are we doing? You want to turn the world upside down? You fill the world with the teaching of Jesus Christ, with the power of the gospel, and trust that power to do what God said it would do. I think the big difference today, ladies and gentlemen, than what it was in the first century, 
is that in, in the first century, Christianity was not a club. It was not a social entity. It was not a filler. It wasn't giving the disciples just something to do in their spare time. That was not how they viewed Christianity. They viewed Christianity with a passion. They viewed Christianity as their life. And this was what they lived to do and to be. Yeah, do you ever notice? Do you ever notice sometimes what the church was referred to in the first century? In Acts chapter nine and verse two, when Saul of Tarsus was persecuting Christian, persecuting the church, the Bible says that he was going to Damascus to persecute the way, the way, W A Y. And, and you know what? Later on, we find that when Priscilla and Aquila were trying to teach Apollos, they were teaching him more perfectly the way of God, the way of the Lord. Now, I'm not saying that's the name of John. I'm just saying, do you notice what that church was called? The way. Why is that? I hearken back to something Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 6. I, speaking of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, they were called the way because it was about Jesus. That was their life. That was their passion. And I'm going to tell you, well, when you have that as your life and as your passion... That means more to you than your occupation. That means more to you than the things that you have. And, and that's the way that those early Christians viewed their relationship with the Lord. It was their life. Jesus meant more to them than what they had. Meant more to them than their possessions. Meant more to them than their homes. Meant more to them than their families. And their jobs. And in many instances their lives. When you've got that kind of passion, I'll tell you what, you're going to see the church grow because you're filling the community with the doctrine of Christ. Acts 6 and verse 7, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly. We've got to go by to trusting in God's great power to save. And then let's add to that. We need to, no matter what happens, we need to always be bold in the face of whatever opposition we might face. We've got to have some courage. We've got to have some bravery on the part of men and women, boys and girls who are Christians. You know, it didn't take long for opposition to mount when the church was growing. When Christians were being made by the thousands, I'll tell you, the enemies of truth and the enemies of God, they, they, they mounted a great opposition. And as a matter of fact, you get over into the fourth chapter of the book of Acts and you find that Peter and John were arrested. And they were brought in before the authorities. And you know what the authorities did? If you notice in verse 17 of Acts chapter 4, the authorities said, But so that it spreads no further, that is the teaching, that they're filling Jerusalem with? We got, boy, boy, we're going to have to stop with that. So that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them. That is the apostles. That from now on they should speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Stay with me here. Here we are. The authorities have spoken. The law is no more preaching. Cut it out. You're going to have to stop it. It's against the law. We don't want this to go on. What would we do here? If suddenly we came here to this building and there was a big black sign posted on the, uh, the door with red letters that said, Stop all of this preaching. Rome Ridge is not allowed again to preach the gospel of Christ. You shut it down. What if that went on to every congregation throughout the, the, the land? What would happen? I tell you what, I tell you what would happen in some places. I'm not saying that. You know, I tell you what happened in some places. In some places you'd have a lot of people that just, you know what, we need to have a business meeting to talk about this. <laughs> you know what, we need to obey the laws of the land. So they say no more gospel meetings. We shut it down. And they say, you know what, no more Bible classes? We just hold Bible class. 
And we don't do that. We've got to obey the laws of the land. Now, that's, that's just, well, you know, what, I don't know what Romans 13 says, and we're going to shut it down. I'll tell you what those Christians did. Those, those, they, they, had a, they had a meeting about it. They did. They, they got together. If, if, if you go on down uh, later on in the chapter, they had a prayer meeting. They didn't have a vision meeting. They had a prayer meeting about it. And, and here's what they did. They prayed about it. Here's what they said in verse 29. They said, Now, Lord, look on, look on their threats. And I, I tell you what, he didn't go on and pray. He didn't say, And make them like us. Make them treat us good. Make them remove these ungodly mandates. No, they didn't say that. They said, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word. God, give us the courage to speak as we ought to speak. Give us the courage to stand up in the face of opposition. Give us boldness to do what you tell us to do. That's why Peter reminded them when they told him that in the first place, we ought to obey God rather than man. You can put that down. And after he made that commitment, they prayed that God would give them the courage to... I tell you, that's what we need. We need to have some prayer meetings and we need to sometimes get down on our knees and ask God to infuse us with courage and infuse us with, 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 with great boldness to proclaim His Word. Amen. That's what we need. You know, the Bible tells us in Revelation 21 and verse 8 that all fearful, the cowards are going to have their place in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. I'm going to tell you what's happening. What, what's happening, ladies and gentlemen, do you know it and I know it. What's happening is we're living in a culture that is designed to make Christians terrified at being Christians. We're afraid. It's made us cowards in many instances. We're afraid to speak out against lesbianism and gay lifestyles and transgenderism and homosexual marriages. We're scared to death to say anything. We don't talk at work about it. We don't talk at school about it. And we don't talk about it in the neighborhood. We're afraid. What's going to happen to me? How are people going to look at me? What's people going to think about me? Are they going to think I'm a bully? They're going to think I'm, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm homophobic? What are they going to think about me? What's God thinking about us? Amen. We're going to have to stand up to these things. You know, I, I tell you something that happened a long time ago is people decided there are two things that you don't talk about to your relatives or to your friends or to anybody for that matter, and that's politics and religion. I don't care what you do with politics, but I'm going to tell you, my friend, you cannot adopt that when it comes to the religion of Christ. I had a friend of mine one time down in Tennessee was telling me that he and his wife often travel and go to various places with a, a fellow that he used to work with that was also retired. And he and his wife and this brother and his wife, they traveled together. And one day that brother told me, he said, well, he said, you know what? He said, so-and-so that I travel with, he's a member of this denomination or whatever it was. I said, oh, well, I bet that kind of causes some interesting conversations on the trip. He looked at me sort of sheepishly, and he said, well, no, not really. He said, we, we, we. He said, as a matter of fact, said, we don't ever talk about religion. We're too good of friends to mess it up by talking about the Bible. You've got to be kidding me. This man's an elder in the church. And there's somebody that you travel with and you know that's not saved and you are not going to talk to him because you're afraid it's going to mess up your friendship and your traveling companion? God, give me the courage to say to my friend what needs to be said. We're afraid to speak out about things that are wrong and things that are sinful and things that are evil because we're afraid of losing a friend, losing a promotion. I'll tell you what, I, have. I got a grandson. I had a grandson that was called three times to the principal's office in public school. And the last time he was called, I know it was a set-up deal, but three times he was called before the principal because he was sharing his faith with another student who had asked him. And he was threatened with expulsion if he mentioned the Bible again. 
Thanks be to God to his parents, my son and his wife, that they yanked him out of that school and put him somewhere where he could Amen. share his faith. We're raising our children sometimes to be afraid of being different. And this is why so many times parents of, uh, of ch parents in the church with children, they permit their children to do things that they ought not permit them to do because they don't want their children to be thought of as different. And they'll allow them to go to dances and they'll allow them to become cheerleaders and they'll allow them to... Uh, do these things that are happening throughout the world so that they will not feel different. What's wrong with us? You look at the first century, those Christians were different. Those, and, and Peter points out, you know, if you, if you suffer as a Christian, glorify God in this name. 1 Peter 4 and verse 16. Don't be ashamed of being a Christian. Be thankful that you can, you, you can be identified as a child of God. We need to be bold in the face of all opposition. Yes, they're going to think it's strange that we run not with them. 1 Peter 4 and verse 4 that we looked at this morning. Who cares? You know, I, as I'm going to share with you Wednesday night, give you my journey of coming out of denominationalism. Before I was a part of a denomination, I was nothing. I wasn't raised religious at all. I, I would say that before my marriage to my wife, that you could count on one hand the number of times that I was ever in a church building of any shape, size, form, or denomination. One hand. And so I tell you, I, you know what, I, 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 I did the things that worldly people did. I engaged in things that worldly people engage in, and I say that to you with shame from the very depths of my being. Somebody said one time, said, what's your, what's your favorite song? I said, well, I don't know if you know it's my, say it's my favorite song, but I'll tell you one that describes the way that I feel. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified. But I'll tell you what, when I found out and I became a Christian, I thank God that there were changes in my life that occurred. And when people saw that, they, you know, I, I remember some time, one time, you know, guy I used to ride to work with, and I was working second to work. But, you know, we, I drive one week and he would drive one week. We kind of did it that way, worked the same shift. Every week that he would drive, he'd have to stop by this little store and he'd go in and buy him two bottles of beer. And he'd drink one on the way to work and he'd save one drink get on the way back. I guess it's good and warm by that time. I don't know. But every time he'd ask me, he'd say, J.R. said, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get me a beer. He said, You want one? I said, No, I don't. I don't, I don't, I don't and he said, yes, and I've been watching you. He said, you don't drink, and you don't smoke, and you don't run around on your wife. And he listened to a couple of other things. He said, you know, I think by the time you're 40, you'll go crazy. <laughs> I don't know about that. Maybe, I, maybe I'm a little closer to that. But yeah, you know, but that's the way that people are going to view you. So what? So what? They think it's strange that you run not with them. We're going to have to have the courage, ladies and gentlemen, to say what needs to be said, to who it needs to be said. And yet, you, you're going to be first. Maybe you might be. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, Paul said, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. That's not going to change. But you know what? Let's get on our knees. And let's ask God, God, grant your servant boldness to be different. Grant your servant boldness to say what needs to be said. They had boldness in the first century in the face of all opposition. And I say that now to segue into the third point. If we want to be successful, we have to begin making dramatic changes in our lives. What is it we're said to be upon becoming Christians? You know, you know what Paul said? 2 Corinthians 7, any man in Christ is a what? He is a new creation in or 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. You're a new creation in Christ. Romans 6 and verse 4, when you're baptized, you know what? You are raised to do what? Walk in newness of life. You know, Sue and I took a trip to Israel last year. And we were given some 
information on these first, and I didn't know they had. They had baptistries over there that they were using in the first century. Now they at first were used as Jewish washing pools, but they were used by Christians uh, as baptistries. And what was interesting about these big old baptistry type things is that it had a wall. It had steps going down in it, but those steps were, had, had a wall between them. And, 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 and I asked about, well, why is that? And they said, well, it symbolizes what it means to become a Christian. You go down as an old, dirty Christian. But you don't come up the same stairs you went down. You come up a new creation. You come up on the other side of that wall. Now that's symbolism, but I believe it teaches an important thing. You cannot be what you used to be and expect to be able to teach somebody the gospel of Christ. They're going to have to be able to see in you what the gospel has done to you and for you and how it has improved your family, your disposition, how it has improved you. What are the changes that they can see in your life? Now, if they can see those changes, then they're going to listen to what you have to say. But they've got to see those changes. They've got to see that you are not the person that you used to be. You know, has it changed your, your outlook on life? Has it changed your deeds? Has it changed your language? Has it changed your behavior? Has it changed your treatment of other people? Has it changed the way you treat a server at a restaurant? People have got to see what it does to you. Did it remove from you hatred? Did it remove from you unkindness? Has the gospel removed from you bigotry? Has it made changes in your life? Listen to how Paul puts this. As he wrote to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4, reminding them that now that, they are a, now that they are Christians, there are changes that have taken place in their life. You put off, verse 22 of Ephesians 4, you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. You know what? You've gone down, the, you come up different. You see you, you, you come up different. He says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Okay, Paul, can you, can you kind of nail that down a little better? Okay, okay, you put on the new man. Well, what's he look like? What's this new man look like? Well, he says, you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and in true holiness. You don't look like you used to. Oh, physically you're going to look the same. But you don't look like you used to. You're different. Well, Paul, can you, can you kind of lengthen that out a little bit? Help, help, help me to understand that. Well, let's, let's see what he says. In verse 25, he said, okay. You used to lie. You used to tell lies. He said, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth to this neighbor, for we're members of one another. Have the people you try to teach, whether it's family members, neighbors, or whomever, your children, have they been able to see in you that now you tell the truth? You don't lie. You don't lie to a telemarketer. You don't lie on your income tax. You don't lie to the insurance company. You tell the truth. You see, this is the change of people that see this. And how, you know, what about your temper? What about your anger? They should be angry and sin. I do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Have they been able to see in you that you're able to let something go? You don't hold on to it. And you don't beat, beat people over the head with it. You used to steal. They don't steal anymore. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good. Oh, and by the way, when you get enough, you can share it with somebody else. You may have something to give him who has need. Can people see that? You see, they, they, in order to be successful in our teaching, they've got to see what that teaching has done to us and for us. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth of what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Have you cleaned up your language? Have you cleaned up your jokes and your storytelling and all these other things? Have you cleaned up your recreation? Has it been, have people been able to see the difference that it's made in your life? Young boy, one time, I met at a gospel meeting. He wanted to. I was down in East Tennessee. He wanted to come up and spend some time and study the Bible with me. 
And he had some time off from work, so I invited him up to Indiana. He came up there and spent a week with Sue and me. We studied together. Had a, had a good first part of the week was just, just great. And then later on in the week, he, he was telling me about this, this girl that he had been dating. And I said, well, tell me about it. What, what, what is she religiously? And he told me what religion she was. And I said, well, what is it you all are saying? Because he wanted some help. He said, well, right now, Brother J.R. said, we, we're sort of hung up on instrumental music. He said, she's in a denomination that thinks that instrumental music is all right. He said, I can't seem to get through to it. And so I, 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 I give him some verses, and we, we talked about that. He said, well, I've done that. Oh, I'll try that. And, and, and so forth and so on. And then later on, during the course of our conversation, I was asking him, how serious is this relationship? And then after talking for a while, he shared something with me that I would say, in, 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 in hindsight, he wished he'd kept to himself. Yeah. But he shared with me that, now here's a young couple. She's not a Christian, and he is supposed to be one. He shares with me that they are sleeping together. They are committing fornication. I shut my Bible. And I said to him, I said, young man, let me tell you something. You might as well keep your mouth shut. Because you're talking about instrumental music and you're living the life that you're living with this young woman. She's not interested in anything you've got to say because she knows what you are. Amen. Yes. You, want to, you, you want to be able to help people to learn the truth? Let them see what that truth has done for you. Let them see the changes that it has made in your life. We're going to talk about Saul of Tarsus, but Saul of Tarsus is one whose who, the change is so obvious in his life. He was breathing threats and murders against the disciples, but when there was a change in his life, it wasn't a gradual change. You know, I, I hear people talking about, well, I'm working on it. Really? You know, I wonder how that go with my wife. Well, I'm working on my adultery problem. It doesn't, it, it doesn't fly with God either. Saul wasn't, wasn't somebody that's working on his opposition to the truth. When he learned the truth and obeyed the gospel, there was a 180 degree turn and he began to preach that which he had attempted to destroy. That's how drastic the changes has to be in our lives if we're going to be successful in reaching people with the gospel of Christ. And then finally, we've got to reach out, as they did, to all the lost, regardless of who the lost is. Regardless of their ethnicity, regardless of their color, regardless of their background, and listen to me, and I'm going to clarify this, regardless of the sin they may be committing. We've got to reach out. You remember what Peter said? Now, he didn't quite understand, I think, the significance of this. But Peter in Acts chapter 2, after telling those disciples, what, or those Jews, what they needed to do to become disciples, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, verse 39 goes on to say, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to as, may, uh, and, and, and to as many as are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call now, what he says there, the gospel is available for everyone. Salvation is available for all mankind. You read through the book of Acts and you find this to be the case. In the early part of Acts chapter 8, you know what the gospel reached? That hated group known as the Samaritans. And Simon and other Samaritans became Christians. Even though, you know, they were looked upon as dogs. And then in Acts chapter 8, later on in that chapter, there was an Ethiopian nobleman that had been to Jerusalem to worship on his way back to Ethiopia, came face to face with the truth of God, and he became a Christian. The first African to become a Christian. In Acts chapter 16, we see the first Europeans who became Christians in Philippi. We see the first you know, Gentiles who became Christians in Acts chapter 10. We see some very wicked people being taught the gospel of Christ in the book of Acts. We see in Acts 24, verses 22 through 25, Felix and Drusilla. You do a, word, you do a study of those two. 
And you find here are some horrible people. And the same is true with Agrippa and Bernice in Acts 26. And yet Paul was preaching to them. He was preaching to, to, to Agrippa who was living in an incestuous relationship. You know, I, I, I would to God that you become altogether as I, except for these chains. Now what's that tell us? That tells us the gospel is for everybody. And if we're going to be successful in the proclamation of the gospel, we've got to try to reach all people. And not just arbitrarily decide somebody is unworthy of the gospel. This person's unworthy. Well, I, I, I know how those people are. I, I'm not. Hey, that's a wrong attitude to take. Well, I, I tell you what, I, I, you know, I, this, this person, well, this, this person's been married six times and it's not going to do me any good to talk to them. Now, they can't remain in a simple relationship. Don't misunderstand me. But you know what they can do? They can leave that relationship and become Christians. Remember what Paul said in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6? He said, you know what, to those, to those, you know, Corinthians, and I'll tell you what, there were some wicked people the Corinthians were. He, he said, but you've been sanctified, you've been justified, you've been washed. And, and you know what? He, he said, you know, God is not going to save the unrighteous, and such were some of you. You used to be adulterers, but you're not adulterers anymore. You've left that. You, some of you were sodomites, but you're not sodomites anymore. You left that. Some of you were fornicators, but you know what? You're not fornicators anymore. You left that. We do wrong. We do wrong, ladies and gentlemen, but looking at somebody and deciding, you know what? Their lifestyle is such that they will never change. How do you know they will never change? I'm thankful to God that somebody didn't look at me and say, you know, here is somebody from the Nazarene church and I know how I, I, I know how indoctrinated those people are, and it's not going to do me any good to have a Bible study with him. I thank God there was nobody looking at me that way. I could begin to tell you the number of people that I know personally who have left ungodly relationships, whether we're talking about homosexuality or adultery, in order to become Christians. And it can be done. We've got to reach out to all the lost. We've got to look at people as who they are. That is, loved by God and God desiring that they be saved. Look at a soul needing a Savior. This is how Jesus looked at the Samaritan woman in Acts chapter, I mean in, in, in John chapter 4. He looked at her as a woman needing a Savior. And he said to her after a brief conversation, I'll give you living water. This is the attitude that we've got to have if we're going to duplicate the success of the early church in the proclamation of the gospel. We and the 21st century church better be reaching out to all the lost. The gospel story continues. It hasn't changed. Our challenge today as 21st century Christians, our challenge is to continue the commission and to carry it on, not only in you know, this community, but throughout the world. What's being written about us? If you're not a Christian this evening, let me, let me offer to you these words of, uh, of, of exhortation. You don't know, you've never experienced what it means to be a child of God. You have no idea what you're missing. You can find the best life upon this earth, the life of a Christian. But that's not the important thing. The important thing is what you will gain in eternity. If you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, arise out of your seat. Confess your faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And look at me again. Turn from a life of sin. Repent of your sins. And be immersed in water this evening for the remission of your sins. And be raised to walk in newness of life. And Christian friend, if you have sinned in a way that has alienated you from God in a public way, make it right tonight. Seek out the Lord tonight. Leave this building in the right relationship with God. And let me say to all of us as Christians, if we have not been serious about why we're here upon this earth, and that is to proclaim the gospel to a lost and dying world, let this be a wake-up call to each one of us. Let us do better. 
in taking the gospel to the lost. If you're subject to the invitation, I urge you to come right now as together we stand and as we sing.